Hallo, mein Name ist Kemal vom Spät Campus. Ihr hört Radio Spätkauf. Yeah. Perfekt. Das ist super. Hello and welcome to Radio Spätkauf, a bi-monthly bi show all about Berlin. As you can probably hear, well, you can't hear the wind whistling in your ears, uh, we're back in the studio. My name's Maisie. I'm Joel. Hi, I'm Andrew. We've had a few episodes outdoors, haven't yes, we, Maisie? Yes, we have. And now we're back in the dark, dank dungeon. <laughs> We've got a full house. Yeah. Coming up on the show, we're going to talk about the Spree Park out in Pentewald, that place full of old dinosaurs and that kind of stuff. Uh, we're also going to be talk, talking to some people who want to ban advertising in the city centre. I'm also going to uh, wax lyrical about what, what I think about the Haus der Berliner Festspiele, a concert venue near the UDK. And Joel's also got some news about an alternative to GEMA, the Creative Commons Collective Society. Short news, Maisie? Yes, short news. Well, we mentioned on Radio Spätkauf a couple of months ago that the Kreuzberg Friedrichshain district had decided to put a ban on new restaurants in certain streets around its jurisdiction. And that seems to be the case in one particular area that is actually part of Kreuzberg, that you might think is part of Neukölln, but it's Grefekitz, um, a very popular little place for cafes and bars. Uh, but apparently the neighbours aren't too happy about it. No. Well, as a result of partly complaints from neighbours, but also... Uh, The idea is to protect um, local businesses, which aren't restaurants, um, existing businesses like Spätis, for example. Um, the local council wants to basically ban new restaurants moving in. So if you were to like try and take over a, sp a space that's being used for something else already, you, you wouldn't be allowed to? I don't think so, no. I think that's why it's been in all the papers. Um, I don't know if it's a good thing, but there's quite a lot of restaurants there. <laughs> There are a lot. It is a nice area. I don't, I don't particularly have the feeling like it's overdone in Grey for Kids, but I don't live there either. But I don't, I, go, I don't go through and think like this is, you know, mini Prenzlauerberg or something. It does have a decent balance in general, but I guess you've got to preserve those sort of things. So that's why these um, regulations are being brought in to try and make sure the balance remains. Yes, and a lot of people living south of there haven't got a very high income, and that's, part, that's related to that as well. And you might have noticed in the news last week that there was a Kim.com intervention in Berlin. <laughs> I believe he was uh, projecting a larger logo onto which building? It was the US Embassy. Kim.com being, of course, that larger-than-life German figure who uh, became a bit of an international media sensation through his website, which was Mega Upload. Um, and, of course, when the authorities cracked down on him and his operation, he fled to New Zealand. Hey, he's still there, but last week, he, uh, and uh, with the help of another artist, that he managed to put his face and a huge projection onto the U.S. Embassy with, with uh, a message about the U.S. being the new Stasi. Of course, this in reaction to all the, the news that we've heard that the U.S. has been hoarding data and is basically you know, spying on us all. I, I for one, think that it's, it's not bad to have Kim.com's face shine on the wall, but it's interesting for us because he was, of course, German. But he, when he started getting prosecuted, um, I did think it was outrageous that everybody suddenly turned on him when we'd all been using his services, Mega Upload, to share files for years. Here, here he was being pilloried in the media, and nobody ever sort of stood up in his defense. Well, the man was providing a service that we all used, and I, I don't think that it's fair that he hadn't suddenly became this, this outcast and this figure who became made fun of. I guess it's a normal thing, like when you realize that someone's wealthy from this activity, I guess you naturally maybe get a bit kind of, uh, people get angry about it, you know, why a free service and then someone's kind of making millions. How do you make money out of Mega Upload? On a business plan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, that's a we, good we, idea. We thought it through. We raised money for Spade Cow. Yeah, Spade Upload. Very good idea. Joel, you know I'm obsessed with all things Eastern. Really? <laughs> yes. Well, as far as, yeah, the end of European Russia. Um, you know the Treptow Park Memorial? Do you ever it, go down there? Fantastic, huge sculpture. If you haven't been, go have a look. It's a massive, huge sculpture of a man standing at the end of this huge, big park, staring off into the distance. Joel, it's not just a park. It's a memorial to the 80,000 Soviet soldiers who died in the Battle of Berlin. And that sculpture, yes, the 13-foot uh, bronze sculpture, in fact, designed by a Russian sculptor, uh, Evgeny Vucicic. Oh, my God, my Russian... Um, and basically, that was based on a man called Ivan Odashenko, who's just died. Um, he lives out in Tambov in Russia, and he's 86. And he was the model, well, he was the, the face model for that sculpture. Um, and he's just died, just passed away. Good-looking man. Well, it's a socialist realist sculpture, Joel. Holding a baby, if I remember correctly. It's a small girl, and actually, I think that's kind of an, well, it's an urban legend. It's, a lot of people say that the sculpture's based on a man who a soldier called Nikolai Masov, who rescued a small child in a hail of bullets during the Battle for Berlin. Um, and, but actually, I, don't think, I think it's kind of loosely based on him, but the sculpture isn't him. Did you know that, that whole sculpture was made from the remnants of the Reichskanzlei, Hitler's 
chancellery. Well, they, they re repurposed it and actually built a Yeah, you know Möhrenstraße? It's Möhrenstraße? Yep, through the Berlin. center of... Yeah, yep. that's made with the, I think, Silesian or something, marble, which was basically mined by sl slave labor for Hitler's Reich's chancellery. And the whole of the Soviet memorial is made of that stuff. So the next victors who come next are probably going to use that to build whatever monument they're going to make in favor of their, <laughs> their victory. Yeah, or hopefully they'll use Alexa. When they've bombed Berlin, they'll use Alexa to make some <laughs> when, amazing When monuments. capitalism's over, yeah. we're going to use the remnants yeah. of, the, of the shopping mall in the centre of town. We can only hope. <laughs> Similar sort of colour, you know. <laughs> I went to another place which quite impressed me the other day, but not in um, how it kind of should have. I went to see Annika. I mentioned her on the last show. Lovely German singer who speaks English like a native. It's shocking. Young girl spent a lot of time in Bristol. Um, she did a gig at this Haus der Berliner Festspiele, which is out in uh, near Judika. And um, it's basically this kind of 1960s, stunning kind of modernist building. Went in, went up the stairs, and basically it was a gig in a corridor. I was really shocked. I paid 10 euro to get in, which isn't much for a gig. Dirty Beaches, we played on the last show. He was opening, giving it his all, you know, suicide style. Uh, and then I was kind of went to the ticket person. And I was like, yeah, so is this it? I could just actually stay standing here and watch the gig from here. You didn't, there was no barrier between like, any of the rooms. It was kind of like you could just see straight in. And I uh, went in, really sweaty, really corridor-like, quite underwhelmed by the whole thing. I love Annika to bits, but the whole thing was a bit like sitting in a library watching your granny doing a gig. So this is a piece of architectural uh, failure, is it? This is a criticism? Yeah, or, or? it's kind of, it's, it's a great building, but they shouldn't be st basically staging gigs in a, a kind of corridor. It's like an afterthought. But did, did, it, did it work at least musically? It was a bit, yeah, Annika, she was a bit nervous. Like, you could see she actually basically looked like she was about to die. She was so frightened. She, you know, mortal fear gripped her. And she was reading notes from a notebook. And I think basically she works as a journalist full time. And most people can't live off music these days. And Annika's, you know, they're not, not that many people know them. Um, she did a good job, but it was kind of, you know, it was a bit underwhelming. The band were really giving it their all. And she was kind of just standing stock still, looking really frightened. Well, after that, um, that, that poignant criticism of the gig and of the location, maybe we should leave the listeners with some positivity by actually playing one of her nice songs. Yeah, in, I just want to say in her defence, I think she's a fantastic singer. She's like, just a bit of sucking up to her there. Uh, yeah, this is a track which actually, this is another classic um, thing of mine. It's a, it's a track that was released <laughs> about three months ago. I've, Joel, I just wanted to say, I want to stop doing this. I keep playing things that have either just happened or um, have been released a long time ago. I'm going to try to get stop my kind of anti-journalism thing and try to get with the programme and stop playing things just when they come out. So this is a track called I Go To Sleep, um, which I think is fantastic. <laughs> We're back with Radio Spätkauf, the Berlin podcast. We're going on 90.7 in Potsdam and 88.4 in Berlin. Um, and of course, we're all in, always online at Reboot FM. Always, Joel. Always. We just discussed the Treptower Soviet monument. Let's move our focus over a couple of hundred meters towards the Spree, where you'll find the fantastic Spree Park, the old Plantevold amusement park, which has been lying in a state of repair and disrepair for, for years. Mostly since 2002. Since 2002, and even before it was, it was sort of on the downhill uh, direction and, and there's an interesting backstory behind this whole park and we're going to give a bit of an update about it now because the whole park went up for auction um, a little while ago and there was a whole bunch of um, of underhandedness going on there that Maisie's going to tell us about in just a bit but uh, for a bit of history the reason the park's been the way it has is because it's gone through the hands of several owners um, who have bankrupted it one way or another um, and it's actually owned it's, it hasn't been in use because it's been um, the ownership has been in dispute um, and to clear it all up, an auction was called. Uh, the idea was that someone would buy this fantastic piece of land and do something amazing with it. But that's not exactly what went down in court a couple of weeks ago. Oh, sorry, not in court, but in the, in the auction house a couple of weeks ago. Maisie, why don't you tell us exactly what occurred and why there is no new owner of Spree Park now and why we're not all going to get to go climb on the dinosaurs straight away? Not yet, no. Um, well, basically, Spree Park GmbH um, own the land and they uh, have been bankrupt since 2002. 
um, sorry, they don't own the land anymore. The land actually belongs to the Liegenschaft funds, who are basically the state. How would you translate it's Liegenschaft? The state funds? real estate um, fund. They, they're yeah. the, the company that uh, is formed on behalf of the, the local city government to own land in the city. Yeah, so it's basically state owned. Uh, and they uh, want to actually, they want to get hold of the lease for the land. Um, because although they own the land, they can't use it because it's leased no. after this other company. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, basically, have a tax bill of 560,000 euro. Uh, which needs to be paid off. And the idea is, is the actual auction was, was called or arranged by the finance... Um, um, basically, they organise this because they want, obviously, someone to pay these tax this tax bill off. Um, and uh, this was held a couple of weeks ago, and the starting price was quite low. Um, obviously, it was this amount of money, this tax bill, plus the court costs. Um, and what happened was is that the bidding went crazy, the bids were much higher than expected because Liegenschaft Fund basically have a company, a, a subsidiary, who went in there who bid about 810000 which is well over the starting asking price. Uh, they thought, oh, we'll get it, no problems. Uh, a company swooped in that... F uh, SP Kultur and Freizeitpark Gimbia swooped in and started pushing up the bids. So on the day of the auction, although the Liegenschaftsfond thought they had it all stitched up and they were going to get the buy the lease on this property, some mystery company swooped in, made a huge offer that they weren't expecting, and threw the whole game out of into disarray. What was the response? Well, what happened was um, the finance amp stopped the auction. Uh, because they claimed that this new mystery company had not uh, paid the 10% the of the starting bid into the account, which is basically a prerequisite for them um, if they wanted to actually have the get the lease. It's sometimes normal in auctions, you've got to put a bit down before yes. you can actually start bidding. Yeah, and the finance amp said, no, uh, mystery company, you haven't done that. End of, end of story, we're going to have another auction uh, within six months. But it sounds like a bit of cronyism going on between the, the Liegenschaftsfonds and this uh, subsidiary company at the end of the finance amp who seemed to think that they were going to get away with them kind of really cheap bargain priced option yes. but were surprised in the last minute by a newcomer who thought they could do something with the park. Yes, and all the companies that are basically investors who've been talking to the finance amped, who've been trying to kind of get in involved in, in this auction because it was very popular, uh, had been apparently put off by the authorities. That's all I know about it. So there's a bit of a strange smell hanging over this whole affair. It Definitely. goes on as if the park didn't have enough colourful history. Here's another chapter to add. The, the day that they tried to auction it and it all went down badly. So who? what's the state of play now? Well, they have to hold another auction within the next um, uh, six months. And the thing is, is the reason that the um, Liegenschaft funds couldn't keep bidding and keep going higher and higher, partly was because they have to get permission from Parliament to raise their bid. Well, they're playing they, with taxpayers' money, aren't yes, they? Yes, exactly. I mean, on the one hand, it might be a good thing if it stays in taxpayers' hands, that land. Uh, but they are, on the other hand, you wonder whether it's OK that they're doing this kind of cronyism. Good point. I might tend to agree with you that it would maybe be better off if you know we all looked after it instead of it being auctioned off to developers. But there was a clause that the thing had to stay as a theme park, wasn't there? Yes, it does. And basically, whoever takes it on has to <laughs> gets all the like the old the plastic swans and the Ferris wheel. Work. I want one too. <laughs> Do we know anything about the mystery company? Um, very little. The company was set up a couple of days before the uh, auction. That's one thing I know about them. So they're very young, very new. Why didn't we make a bid, Maisie? Because we don't have the money. <laughs> Good <point. laughs> that hasn't stopped people in the past in Berlin. You could just buy anything for nothing, couldn't you, here? That's well, that's what the Liegenschaft funds used to famously do, and that's the reason you've got a lot of luxury flats being built all over the city is because a lot of the land post uh, post the collapse of communism, uh, the Liegenschaft funds was desperate to pay off Berlin's huge debts, um, and uh, basically they sold off all these incredible, incredible pieces of land right in the city centre uh, to uh, luxus immobilien companies, luxury estate, real estate companies. Well, we don't really know the intentions of that mystery buyer who tried to snap up the Spree Park. We don't know what they're going to do with the space. I'd either turn it into a massive, massive swimming pool mm -hmm. um, and then like do up all the swans and everything. Inflatable and so can, dinosaurs. Yeah, and it'd be like massively subsidised. Like, so you'd have like cheap entry for everyone. Yeah. Uh, and uh, like, or I would turn it into a, a GDL theme park. I think you might be onto something there. That's going to be the next thing coming, isn't it? I mean, I think the whole cycle of exploitation of the idea of the East it hasn't yet reached its pinnacle. And no. I think there's going to be time yet to, to where, where we will be having theme parks based on East German themes. And that's going to be the kitschy... What, like Jurassic Park? Yeah. <laughs> It's just, it's just a logical next step. You've got Trabi Safaris, you've got the DDR Museum, you've got everyone in all this kitschiness. Uh, it's got to be the next step, the, the actual revival of a real GDR theme park. Well, it could be like Westworld. Have you ever seen that film with Yul Brynner? 
Uh, it's loosely, it's the Terminator, I think, is loosely based on, it's basically ripped off uh, the, the West World, which is basically a theme park full of uh, robots uh, or humanoids or whatever. And I think I quite like the idea of um, going into a, a theme park and having kind of humanoid Eric Honecker's and members of the Stasi. Well, like people in uniform, like uh, costumes in the streets, like as if you're talking to the old. Yeah. yeah. I, you could, I can see it, Maisie. You'd It'd be, be awful, in heaven. You'd live it? in there. You'd love it. Yeah. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> I'd completely change. <laughs> you would. It's already happened in Lithuania. There's like an old... Um, yes. Is it Butrus? Is that the sculpture part? No, that's yeah, that's the sculpture part, yeah. I think the idea was that you were supposed to get a train from Vilnius and be kept as kind of prisoners of as war say, and taken all the, the way. Yeah. yeah, the novelty of the GDR part. So you go in, you never go out. You maybe know? get off at Alexanderplatz and get the train there and then... Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about German rap, Joel? Um, I'm going to leave that one up to you. Because <laughs> I get the impression a lot of people don't like... Andrew, what do you think about German rap? Uh, I heard some rapping on the U-Bod the other day. That was kind of... Was it good? Um, unique. Unique? Yeah. That's Maybe like... it's good for me to learn German. Yeah. Very I fast. think it's, it's a good, it is a good way. Because when I came here as a student, I listened to Cool Savas. And I'm sure any German listeners out there will be laughing at me for having done that. But actually, it did teach me quite a lot of German uh, that and, and Rammstein, nice. Rammstein. Um, but I've got a track here, which is a, which is a kind of politically correct rap uh, by some white rappers from Berlin. And one's an actor, and they're called uh, Shaban and Captain Peng, and the song is called "Sie mögen sich." <laughs> Back on Radio Spakehouse with myself, Joel, Maisie and Andrew. You know, one thing we should be doing more often on this show, Maisie, I think, is updating our listeners on stories that we have reported on in the past. One such story is the outrage over GEMA, the music rights collection agency, which last, was the number one um, devil of the year last year. Everyone, everyone loved to hate GEMA. Um, and there were tons of stories about how GEMA was going to destroy the Berlin nightclub scene and how we all wanted to get rid of it. And what's happened since then, Joel? Well, none of the nightclubs have closed. You might have noticed that Bergheim's still open. Um, and we're still getting our videos blocked all the time by Gamer when we're trying to stream them. But um, So basically the state of play between Gamer and the clubs is still in flux. There's still disputes going on and clubs are still trying to renegotiate the new high rates that they will have to pay. But one group has decided to push ahead and try and create an alternative to Gamer never, nevertheless. We had an inter interview last year with one of the gentlemen named Wolfgang from the Creative Commons Collection Society, or C3S, which is a group that's trying to create uh, an alternative system to the to Gamer. Wolfgang, we met you last year and you told us about uh, the plans to create an yeah. alternative to Gamer. Yeah. Can you tell us what's happened since? Right now we are preparing a, a crowdfunding campaign and it's going to start on July 15th. We hope it's going to be uh, quite a big thing and the uh, target is uh, to get, first of all, financial means, but also to find members. And remind us again why it's important that we have C3S. It's important because not all creators are really represented uh, here in Germany by uh, GEMA. There's a lot of creators uh, working with Creative Commons stuff or creators uh, who don't want uh, to go with GEMA because they are not uh, organized in a, de a democratic way and they are not using that much of modern technology, for example, for having a, a very detailed billing structure, which is uh, possible right now via uh, audio fingerprinting and uh, something like that. And uh, so this is why we uh, need uh, C3S. And most of all, it's uh, a more flexible concept because C3S uh, will provide the uh, possibility to get uh, not only Creative Commons licenses, but also all rights reserved licenses and not only uh, with the whole of your work, as it is with GEMA, but uh, you can tell us to administrate uh, certain works of yours uh, certain songs and with different uh, different uh, licenses. What's happened in the past year with Gamer? Last year there was a lot of concern that there were going to be clubs and places that were shut down shut down because of the high Gamer fees. Has that happened? Uh, no, it hasn't happened and there have been negotiations between the clubs and between Gamer and it's uh, a constant to and fro between both and I don't know uh, where the development uh, is uh, right now but uh, I think 
right now it's uh, kind of a status quo between uh, both and uh, so there isn't happening that much. And would this C3S plan, would it help the situation that people have with video where they can't access a lot of videos online in Germany? Not directly uh, because of course uh, there's uh, still uh, the possibility that um, YouTube has uh, videos online in which GEMA content is integrated but by having uh, a second uh, alternative collection society of course uh, there's also a movement uh, within the uh, market and that will have more pressure on, on GEMA then and I think uh, this is uh, the most important aspect of it. What can individual musicians do? Should they join up to the C3S? If you're uh, already uh, quite successful Successful, it's uh, maybe at this point uh, better to go with GEMA. But if you're a musician just coming up and uh, you can't really decide, uh, then it's maybe better to wait uh, until uh, we get the license from the uh, German Patent and Trademark Office. Then we can also administrate the licenses for independent musicians uh, on our own. The website is C3SCC. The uh, crowdfunding campaign will run on uh, Start Next. Radio 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 Bing Bang Boom. Advertising plays a major role in today's society. Whether it be online, on TV or on our streets, we expect to experience it on a daily basis. It may add vibrance to a city, but have you ever thought how a city like Berlin would look without it? I met with Giovanni and Richard, who are campaigning towards a ban on corporate advertising in Friedrichshain and Kreuzberg districts. Giovanni first introduced the organisation to me and later Richard explained his motivation for joining the campaign. We initiated the Amt für Werbefreiheit and Gutes Leben because we really figured out that um, the advertising industry is causing some, some troubles. If you ask yourself the question, what is actually the goal of advertisement, um, there's actually a marketing director of Coca-Cola, a former marketing director, to telling us the goal of advertisement is to sell more stuff to more people, more often more expensive. We get bombarded with advertisements telling us that we need to buy, buy and buy. And we figured out that this is real, causing, causing, causing problems. And so we initiated the Amt für Werbefreiheit and Gutes Leben, which is of course not official, but we try to make them uh, official and, they, and it actually does look official. And we're trying to initiate a critical discourse about advertising and, um, and its impact. I read about the organization and the newspaper and I thought uh, this is a really good cause. I was always like uh, affected by advertising, of course, as a consumer and as a, like an inhabitant of the city. But I was also working and advertising myself and I, I got uh, doubts about it at the time. I thought like it's, it might not be right to manipulate people into feeling that they are in lack of something, that they need something, that the solution is to consume something in order to become happy. I think I started with the belief that ads are not able to manipulate me in a way that I think they actually are able to. Uh, that's what, what I think many people say to me as well. They think like, oh yeah, Richard, uh, advertisements, they're just there, but uh, they don't make me actually buy things immediately. But working in the advertising industry made me think differently about that. Often, often, uh, like a single ad is not able to make you consume immediately, but it it gets into your brain, and it makes people uh, speak about certain kind of products, and it creates like a, a social a social situation where you maybe due to peer pressure are encouraged to live in a certain way. Advertisement is only has only been created to uh, make people consume more. It's about it's about like uh, creating growth in our society, and we believe that uh, growth is something a model from from yesterday. Because today we we can't really afford to have more growth because we already are exceeding our natural resources, anyways. And I I, I never never met anyone who really said he's been more happy by consuming more. If I if I'm on the internet, I can use an ad blocker. If I uh, read a magazine. 
I can just uh, flip the flip the page. So all this works. But sorry, I have to go um, to to my workplace. I have to go to university whatsoever, and um, you can't escape the advertising which is on the street. We talked to the members of the. German Parliament, the Bundestag, and some of them were quite open to the topic and they supported a votum uh, for um, our goal to uh, reduce advertisement. Um, but of course um, we couldn't really influence um, a concrete law or we couldn't uh, really um, set the agenda for the for the next election. There, there, are, there are good good ideas about um, reducing advertisement. For instance, in France, uh, two weeks ago, Uh, a law passed the parliament um, which now uh, doesn't allow um, electric uh, bulbs on on on, adverti on, on advertising posters uh, outdoor and um, the, the the mayor of Friesen Kreuzberg is also quite open to the topic and actually Friesen Kreuzberg banned um, advertisements that are uh, for, for unhealthy products let's say uh, cigarettes and alcohol um, so There is there's some there's some there's some action in Friedrichshain Kreuzberg and thought okay this is the right district to initiate um, to initiate our Einwohnerinnenantrag um, which you can sign um, we need 1,000 um, signatures and um, the the goal of the Einwohnerinnenantrag is um, to ban commercial outdoor advertisements in Friedrichshain Kreuzberg. Although the campaign and petitioning is for a total ban on corporate advertising in Friedrichshain and Kreuzberg, it also seems to extend to an ideology for a better quality of life. When visiting the organisation's website, I was intrigued by a subheading title called The Good Life. I asked Giovanni and Richard what this meant to them and the campaign. The Amt für Werbefreiheit und Gutes Leben is uh, not only against ads, but it's also for the good life. And the good life for me means something which is, of course, determined to be uh, by every individual itself. Um, means something like uh, working less, means something like about uh, spending more time with friends, uh, interacting socially without going to the mall every weekend or something like that. The, the campaign, of course, is uh, about to start a, a discourse about these kind of topics it's about like to make people people think about what advertising does to them and uh, on the practical hand we really try we set ourselves a goal which we think is achievable that uh, means that we want to ban advertisement public advertisement from the streets of Kreuzberg and Friedrichshain by 2014. We think it's not very creative to think that Uh, advertisements make a city more livable. We think that advertisements are being put there by uh, companies, the companies who can pay most for uh, getting the space. So it's not really what the people want, we think. And apart from that, we think it could also be like an outstanding um, thing for Berlin to be ad-free, like Sao Paulo in Brazil, which is ad-free since 2007. You can go on our website, which is www.amtfuerwerbefreiheit.org. You can download the petition on our website there to ban commercial advertisement in Friedrichshain Kreuzberg, sign it. And um, there is also the address in the Kieferstraße 20 where you can, um, you can bring the petition. And before we go, we've got to give a very big uh, thank you to somebody who's been involved in Radio Spätkauf now yeah. since the very start of the year. And her name's Nomi. And Nomi's been our producer sitting in the studio helping us get our sound and technique right. If you have been a listener of Radio Spätkauf and you noticed that somewhere around the January part of the year that our recording quality got a hell of a lot better, <laughs> well, that's thanks to Nomi. And we don't thank her enough, but she's sitting here now. So thanks very much for all your work. Thanks for listening in on Radio Spätkauf. Logistic.